Okay. So okay. you first enter the game Roblox. Okay, Roblox is open. And then you can press, if you want, to add friends, if you want to be friends. Okay. Yep, I see you. I'm Nicole Edwards. I'm a journalist doing a deep dive into kids and technology. And today, I'm playing for the very first time on the wildly popular gaming platform, Roblox. You have to jump over all these lasers. So see the lasers? You can't touch them. I keep getting lasered. It's bad. Oh, man. Wally and Bella are my Roblox tour guides. They're cousins and best friends. One lives in BC and the other lives in Ontario. What's the best thing about this game, do you think? Um, well, I think I like because me and Bella go on FaceTime on the iPad and play so we can talk to each other in the game. So that's kind of fun. That's one of my favorite things is like even though Wally lives in the like a five hour plane ride. Um, we, I could still like play with him and we could like pretend that we're right next to each other. Thanks to this platform, Wally and Bella can meet on a digital playground in lieu of an in-person play date. I, on the other hand, probably won't be a regular here. Oh, the stairs disappear. That's what you were telling yeah. me. Dang, I was doing so well. <laughs> 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 so go through the yellow, yellow door. Okay, go through yellow, the yellow, green. Yellow, yellow, yellow. Okay, then go through the green. Oh my gosh, then how I do think you see? it's the orange. How do you know? Um, you Whoa. die. I did die. I have my co host Taylor to thank for arranging my introduction to Roblox. <laughs> my pleasure. I'm Taylor Owen, and Wally and Bella are my son and my niece. I'm an academic who researches media technology and democracy. And as the parent of an eight-year-old, the world of kids and technology, both all its positives as well as all its potential dangers, are things that I think a lot about these days. There's just no guidebook for parents when it comes to these issues. And on this podcast, our search for answers took us to some unexpected places. You're listening to Screen Time. There are huge questions playing out right now over the place of technology in our lives. Facebook was scheming to bring even younger users into their field. You're basically giving out your personal ID to games so they can make money for it. There are some people that I would like to block in real life. We could work together, but I will add that there are tensions because in the app market, their job is to sell, sell, sell. There's a lot that like, I just don't understand. This is their platform, this is their life. Where's the limit? Every parent is struggling with these questions. Governments around the world are trying to keep up, and the scale and pace of change is only increasing. In this show, we'll talk to parents and kids about how they navigate the digital world. And to the researchers and policymakers who can help us understand the consequences. Today, Roblox, Minecraft, the metaverse, and how they're changing friendships for kids. Do you want to see a different game? It's not an obby, but... So the game is mainly about... There is one person who's in the dark. I grew up with family members all over Canada and the US and the UK, so I'm kind of envious because you can see how close the two of them are even though they only get to see each other in person twice a year. Yeah, me too. And I, I was the same way. I had cousins all over the world and got to see them once every year or two. And now there's this world where my son can hang out in Roblox with his cousin every day. And I'm, I'm so conflicted on it because I, it means allowing him to spend way more time in a video game than I would have previously thought I was going to. But on the other hand, it's a really real and special relationship these two kids have. And in talking to other families for this episode, it seems like the extent to which kids socialize on Roblox really varies. So there are kids like Wally who only has like a few close friends on Roblox. And then there are kids who use it really as their main social outlet, right? So they spend as much time socializing with kids on Roblox as they do socializing with friends offline. 
Yeah, look, just to, to reinforce what you said, kids are spending a lot of time in these games. 75% of American kids between age 9 and 12 use Roblox. Mm -hmm. So this is a ubiquitous <laughs> it's a mind -blowing virtual statistic. world. It's, it's remarkable, right? And then you add the other virtual worlds like Fortnite and Minecraft into that. And we're talking about like most kids at most ages are socializing in these spaces. Yeah, absolutely. And making friendships that feel so real to them with kids that they aren't seeing in person. And I feel like that puzzles a lot of parents. We know that we're on the cusp of kids potentially spending even more time than they do now immersed in these worlds. And I think it's really important that we start asking questions about this, because as you say, there is a real push coming now to shift into what some people on Facebook in particular are calling the metaverse. More and more of our lives, if they have their way, and if they have their design, <laughs> right. are going to be spent in these immersive virtual spaces. More of our work life, and for kids, more of their education life and more of their socializing in these worlds. Do you know what the metaverse is? No. If you had to guess, what does it sound like? What do you think it is? The universe? Is it like an online thing? Like a, an app online? The online -iverse? We're having a hard time figuring out exactly what the metaverse is. Yeah, and there's good reason for that. I just don't think we know for sure what it is yet. In the dictionary, it says the metaverse is an online space that people inhabit together as avatars, and that we'll meet there using augmented reality, game consoles, headsets, mobile devices, or computers. In one possible version, our digital and physical worlds may interact with each other much more seamlessly. In another version, we might end up doing all sorts of things that we do in the physical world in digital spaces. So we may be able to enter the metaverse through a platform and some of these already exist, and do a whole range of different things, from going to versions of our office, to going shopping, to seeing a concert. Okay, so I see the similarity to Roblox then, because in Roblox, you can meet up with friends in different games, and it sounds like in the metaverse, you'll be able to do something similar, meet up with people in these different virtual spaces. Exactly, and in fact, many have argued that the metaverse is already here, and that kids are on the front lines. I'm going to introduce you to a family with two kids who have very different relationships with Roblox. Hi, my name is Audrey. Hi, my name is Tristan. How old are you? We're both 10 and we're twins. What's the best part about being a twin? Nothing. Yeah, we hate each other. No, they don't. Yeah, we do, Mom. You know this. <laughs> That'll change. Maybe I'll be generous and give her money when I become an NHL player. I don't know, though. So Taylor beat Audrey and Tristan, twins. <laughs> Tristan is super silly and smiley and very outgoing, and he would much prefer to see his friends in person than play with them on Roblox. I just don't think it's as, like, appealing. You don't really get to know them as much as seeing someone in person, I find. So I have a friend named Ian, and I sometimes play with him online, but it's just, it's not the feeling that I think I would get if I was like playing soccer or something like that. I think Wally, Bella, and Tristan, who you just heard, are all kind of on one side of the coin when it comes to the way kids interact with games. Mm. But then there's a second twin in this equation whose name is Audrey, and she really could not be more different. Like, she's soft-spoken, she's into art, and she loves Roblox. She said she spends more time hanging out with friends there than she does in person. And even during our conversation, she wasn't really chiming in very much. Tristan did most of the talking until Tristan made this confession. And I'm going to sound like a nerd saying this, but I, like, I'm going on the internet and sometimes I can't even understand what people are saying. I can. It's all like slang talk. Yeah, it's all like L-U-V and just Instead of you, it's actually just you. It's just all weird. I, I understand all that because that's like that's like the short version. Everyone types like that in Roblox. Like or, no one types you. 
anymore. It's just like the word. It's just the letter U. And I D K means I don't know. I D C means I don't care. It's just it's all confusing. Yeah, I I know a, I know like what every one of those stands for. I love the pride in Audrey's voice there, yeah. and it's because we were talking about her thing. It's Roblox. Yeah, I mean, it kind of strikes a nerve because I think part of the challenge we face here is companies largely are building the worlds in which our children are growing up and inhabiting. Some kids might want to just play in playgrounds and just do sports and never go in a video game. Yeah. But are we kind of normalizing this in a way that is excluding people who don't fit into that kind of social interaction and don't value it? And I worry that we're constraining rather than opening up our worlds via these technologies. It's so interesting you you read it that way because I heard from Audrey sort of like a little glimmer of hope in the fact that these kids are so immersed in these online worlds. I have a feeling that she gets to be herself and like the fullest version of herself when she's playing Roblox with other kids. And I wonder if she didn't have access to that world, whether she would have the same level of social satisfaction that she seems to get when she goes and plays Roblox with her friends. Yeah, and that's the flip side of this. And it's, it's always been the case with the internet and with digital technologies is they've both constrained and open up people's opportunities. Yeah. So Chantel is Audrey and Tristan's mom. And her biggest concern is who Audrey is spending so much time with on Roblox, mm. right? Because her friends on there aren't kids from school and they're not kids from the neighborhood. But she's obviously very attached to them. Here's Chantel. It means so much to Audrey to be online. And I don't want to put restrictions on her having friends and having fun. Roblox is, you don't really see it very much in Fortnite and Minecraft. But Audrey being on Roblox, she's constantly sending messages back and forth. And it'll say, like, can you get off? It's time for dinner. And she said, like, OK, I just got to let my friend know. And like, who are you talking to? And then it's some handle that I, I don't know. I don't know who this person is. So that that part yeah. is is tough. But she looks at them as her legitimate friends. The anxiety we just heard there is something I really share. That's a common refrain that I'm hearing from parents when we talk about Roblox. A lot of them are just freaked out by the fact that their kid has these really strong attachments to people that they only see in the game. So I'm hoping that we can contextualize this world a bit for parents and help them understand how these types of attachments form between kids who don't see each other out on the playground like the days of old and help give them a sense of if there are any concerns here. A lot has changed since video games first came into the scene in the 1970s. And as they've moved from arcades to consoles in our living room, to the palms of our hands with cell phones, and now evolving onto headsets and into virtual and augmented realities, ideas about what gaming is have also evolved. I asked Katie Salen Teckenbosch about the significance of these shifts. She's a professor of informatics at the University of California at Irvine, with a background in video game design. And she works with youth Minecraft experts to create kid-friendly online communities through her organization, Connected Camps. We used to think that kind of common narrative about digital games was they were single player. They were mostly boys. There were a lot of first person shooters, but there wasn't this idea that kids were using games to socially connect or using games to build worlds. So what has changed over time with the invention of environments like Roblox, like Minecraft, like Fortnite Creator, is these are spaces where kids can simultaneously socially connect with others. They can build and design their own environments, and they can really connect with friends and mentors that share interests with them. So I think parents are starting to understand that kids play games not for the content, which is sort of how they used to think about it, like, oh, my kid wants to play a shoot 'em up game. It's more like, oh, my kid's going online to play with their friends. 
And so I think that shift to the social worldness of games is really the big shift. I mean, the other thing to, to understand about games is when we talk about kids playing games, it's not just the game that they're playing. They're in the platform. They're also most likely connecting with a Discord server, which is a kind of social voice space. They're talking about the game in real life, right? With their friends on the playground, in the classroom, at home. So when we talk about kids' gaming practices, we have to talk about them in this sort of ecological way. Yeah, it's an ecosystem of interactions. It is, exactly. It's a combination of platforms that have come together to, I think, really make the social interaction really rich. And it's why games are kind of leading the way for lots of folks around the sort of destination where people want to go to socialize and play with friends. If a healthy ecosystem involves both online and in-person friends, what happens to a kid developmentally when they don't have as many friends in person? I suspect that during the pandemic, a lot of parents have seen that happen. I asked psychologist and video game researcher Chris Ferguson about this. He's a professor at Stetson University in Florida, and his work revolves around the differences between behavior in games and behavior in person. My big question for him was about the consequences for kids who have more of a social circle online than in their neighborhoods. It's a complicated thing. It's not really easy to really make a clear divide between online friendships and real life friendships. The evidence does suggest that overall real life friendships still do have something of an advantage over online friendships in terms of quality and the kind of support you can get. The people you meet online aren't going to help you move. But on the other hand, online friendships are definitely better than no friendships. And I think, you know, a lot of adults think, well, if my kid's online all the time, they're not making real friends. And that's really not the conclusion that we come to. There seems like there are some very clear benefits of types of engagement that are not just slightly different, but are only possible in these digital spaces. I would imagine even people being able to find others that are more like them in ways in the, that in their, in their physical worlds might just not be possible. Absolutely. Yeah, that, I mean, exactly what you said is true. I mean, when you're stuck in middle school or high school, you're just stuck with a bunch of people that, you know, just by the random luck of a birth cohort yeah it's a random hundred <laughs> people you happen to be around yeah <laughs> but that's great if you're like sort of a average kid who likes the stuff that average kids like and then you get certain populations of kids too like with autism spectrum kids that may actually have an easier time making online friendships than than real life friendships because of you know sort of the behavioral and cognitive and social consequences of autism you know you can form these lasting and meaningful relationships that you may not have gotten if you were stuck with the people you lived in your immediate neighborhood Interesting. So for some kids, there may actually be advantages to having strong ties with people online. Absolutely. I mean, when you think of kids who are new to the country, for example, or a trans kid living in a small town, peer support might only be possible through people they meet on the internet. When I was talking to Audrey, these two categories of friends seemed interchangeable to her. Your friends online mean as much to you as the friends you see in person? Yeah. Does it feel different, the, the two different friendships? Um, not, not really. For kids who fall into the category of having more friends online, and we're circling back to our question from Audrey's mom, Chantel, here, how can we account for how real those friendships feel to some kids despite distance? Well, as both many adults and kids know from experience, games can bring people closer together. They're team activities in many ways, and Research shows and confirms that this can make them really powerful unifiers. Katie Salen Teckenbosch from UC Irvine says the rise of gaming is part of the reason some kids don't see boundaries between online and physical worlds in the same way their parents might. Over the past five years, we've moved away from this very black and white distinction between in real life and online. We are learning increasingly how to manage friendships that sort of seamlessly move from a real world space into an online space. So I don't think it's useful to think about this idea that one is pulling away from the other because I think they're very much kind of layered experiences. The thing that's interesting about games is that it used to be that gamers were sort of this niche. You would say, oh, they're a gamer. Everybody's a gamer now. Kids who don't game actually are in the minority. If your kid is not a gamer and not even kind of thinking about them as places to connect with friends, 
that's probably the kid you're more likely to be worried about because it's sort of indicating that they're kind of socially isolated, that they're not connecting with their peer groups. And that's not to say that all kids need to be obsessed with gaming, but it is very much currency for young people. According to Katie, gaming is a useful primer for the realities kids of today will face as they grow up, especially as things like metaverses develop. Kids need to become literate in understanding how to be with other people online. It is a literacy, a critical literacy. And if we imagine our kind of civic society going forward, that literacy is absolutely one of the things that should be top of mind for parents. We often hear about all of these platforms, Minecraft, Fortnite, and, and Roblox, as being sort of early versions of a metaverse. And metaverse is obviously a much more sort of normalized concept than it was even six months ago now. Yeah, yeah. But do you see this, these all as spaces that are kind of normalizing a new generation to the idea of a metaverse? Yes, yes. So one thing we saw during the pandemic is that kids, when they couldn't find a space that they wanted to socialize and play and they made their own. And that was in part because there were these platforms like Roblox, Minecraft, Fortnite Creator, where they could. So these proto metaverses, like some of their qualities are they're openly available. They have a set of tools that are sort of easily learned and they can build stuff or make games in them. You know, there's whole generations of kids that are growing up with this idea that I can build my own virtual world. Like it's not, it's not complex, right? They just, they can do it. So I think for young people, this is a very normal kind of idea that one would construct in a kind of linked set of spaces across which they can socialize, they can work, they can play, they can learn. So Katie agrees that kids are being primed for the metaverse through gaming. Yes. Katie thinks we can use kid-friendly gaming servers as a model for how to create healthy online communities for kids. Servers are like little neighborhoods within a platform that are controlled by the person who creates them, who can set the codes of conduct that users have to follow. Katie's team works with young people to create Minecraft servers that are optimized for kids at different developmental stages. It's given her ideas about what our priorities could be as we create spaces for kids in the metaverse. The critical question as we move towards this real vision of a metaverse is sort of how you balance kids' agency, their sense of belonging, their creative autonomy and empowerment with security and safety. This is, I think, the really big challenge. Minecraft and Discord are exactly the same in the sense that anyone can spin up their own server. And what we're seeing, again, is a really positive opportunity for young people when they spin up a server to develop the code of conduct for their server. Discord has this amazing moderator academy that anybody can go to for free. It really helps them understand how to set up a code of conduct, how to moderate in ways that keep people safe, but also really support agency and belonging and these kinds of things. So you're starting to see the genre of platform that can be really great. So to be sure I understand, Katie's team facilitates servers that are run by young people, but ultimately overseen by adults? Right. The youth moderators are normally a bit older, sometimes even college students. So the younger users get to learn from their example. Ah, uh, this sounds like a virtual version of LITs, leaders in training. When I was little, LITs would be at some of the camps I went to. They were kids in their early teens that were given leadership training, and some of them had the responsibility to look after younger kids. And then, of course, if anything went wrong, they would escalate to an adult. Kids of different ages have different kinds of developmental needs, eight years old, nine, ten. They're at an age where their ability to empathize with others is still developing. So they have a hard time still taking the perspective of another person. They are starting to move away from strong connections to their family and adults to into the peer, kind of peer space. They need to be able to take risks. They need to be able to experiment, particularly around issues of identity. And a lot of the current approaches to security do not enable all of those things. Right? They want to shut down risk taking. They want to very much control who kids are connecting with. And we know from research that kids really thrive in intergenerational contexts. So there is a movement towards age verification, which sort of says, oh, all middle school kids need to be together. What we say is, well, actually, if you look at the research, that's not a great model. 
Because they learn from adults. They do. They learn from caring adults, also near peer mentors. So kids that are slightly older than them. So when you talk about these things, they're not features of the platform. They're features of the people. To date, there's been a lot of focus on what can the technology do? What can machine learning do around content moderation? All of that stuff is important, but we have to begin to look at the mechanisms for really supporting and training and scaffolding the people in the server. And, you know, by the age of 10, kids really need to be given opportunities to self-regulate. They need to be given opportunities to engage in conflict in really positive ways. So that's where moderation comes in that is really attentive to the needs of the kids. Listening to Katie, it sounds like it takes a lot of people power to create virtual spaces that are kid friendly. And time is a luxury that many parents I've talked to say they do not have much of. And that makes me think that old equity issues might follow us into the metaverse. Does it seem to you like kids who don't have parents with a lot of extra time to spend learning about all this might be more vulnerable in these metaverse spaces? Absolutely. And I think that's, that's such an important point that if social development in these online worlds is as important to a kid's future as Katie says, which I, th I think is something we can debate, then access to tech and broadband, as well as strong parental oversight, are all prerequisites for a positive experience. Right. So in response to this, Katie advocates for developing a social safety net in the metaverse hmm. that's ultimately similar to programs we see for kids in the physical world. There need to be public digital playgrounds. Research is also showing that kids from lower economic households, kids of color, are most likely to have parents out of the home, the least likely to have their environments tailored by caring adults, partially because the parents are busy, they're working three jobs. So what is needed are these kind of trusted intermediary organizations, right? But those should be publicly funded. These are spaces that take ownership over developing the, you know, the kinds of codes of conduct, the kinds of scaffold that we know are developmentally appropriate for kids, create opportunities for mentorship, and they can kind of take on the role of what a caring adult would do in a home where a parent is able to do that. Because right now, a lot of the policy puts so much pressure on parents to be digitally literate and savvy, to have the time, but it really needs to be on the public agenda. It strikes me just that's precisely why we built publicly funded broadcast media, right. was to create safe spaces. <laughs> They were aligned with broad social values and were inclusive. Right. So I think there's a parallel now, the kind of parallel need that moves beyond television, video to these interactive playground digital spaces. In the meantime, what can parents do to make sure their kids are getting the most socially out of their time gaming? So Chris Ferguson, the psychologist I spoke with earlier in the episode, has a checklist of things for parents to keep in mind. What I try to tell parents to ask is three or four things. Really, it's like, is your kid's grades about where they should be, given your kid's ability and sort of normal progression in school? Are they still about where they, you know, you would expect them to be? So there's that. Are they getting enough sleep at night? Is your kid getting adequate exercise? You know, are they getting as much social experience, you know, whether that's online or in real life, as they feel that they need? Uh, again, a different, kids are going to be different in terms of what they need. And sort of related to that are, do they express being happy? As long as you can kind of say yes to all that stuff, you really don't have a problem. And that's always really kind of the standard thing, whether they're talking about social media or video games or VR or, or anything else. And Katie has a few suggestions too. So research is showing that what has been very beautiful about online environments for many kids is that they have more control, right, about how they connect, who they connect with. So part of that conversation from a parent perspective is understanding that there are these benefits, but they're not universal, right? You can't just say all games are good for kids, right? Under certain conditions, right? Where a parent is aware that they understand what a kid is kind of doing in the game. They're in conversation with their kid about what's happening. And the conversation should very much be about the experiences of that child in the space. That's a way to connect with your kid, but also it's a way to help them process things that might've happened to them in the space, right? Whether there was a kind of like aggressive interaction or they were having a hard time making friends, like things that a parent would naturally do watching their kid on a playground. The same thing is true in digital spaces. It's just harder for parents because it looks unfamiliar.
At the start of the episode, we set up Tristan and Audrey as two kids who were very different, but I don't really feel that way now. Tristan plays hockey, Audrey plays on Roblox. They're both into games. One's just playing on the ice while the other's playing on their computer. And I think something that would be helpful here is new language. You know, Taylor, you've mentioned that some academics have stopped referring to the physical world as the real world. And that makes a lot of sense because calling the in-person world real implies that the online world is somehow lesser. Yeah, and if you're a kid who is getting real meaning out of a digital space and your parents dismiss that as being fake or not real, that doesn't really open up a positive line of communication between you and your parent. It shuts you out. Right. Emily, one of our producers, referred to the in-person world as the meat space, as in flesh, which is super gross, and I think we could do better, but it's a start. <laughs> and I really think that changing the way we talk might help change the way we think about these digital spaces. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, we started this episode with your family, Taylor, so I'm really curious to hear what you've learned yeah, this episode has really hit home in part because I'm looking for guidance myself. I'm trying to figure out how to navigate these new digital worlds that my eight-year-old is increasingly spending time in and what I should be allowing him to do and not. And I think I'm getting a better understanding about how to engage with him responsibly about this. And one of the main things I've sort of taken away from all of this is that these aren't binary decisions. These aren't games you let them play or not play. These are a part of kids' lives in some meaningful ways. It's not just about the game. It's about the type of social interaction that is enabled in that digital space. Right. And it's that social interaction that is both the thing they most like about it, that's the value they get from it, but it's also the thing that, as parents, we need to be most aware of. So it's much less about what the game is they're playing and much more about the terms in which they are engaging as participants in that space. So when Katie, for example, mentioned that Minecraft servers all have like codes of conduct and rules that their participants have to follow, that to me is like, it's a kind of an incredible filter through which to look at these spaces. Yeah. So whenever Wally goes into one of these Minecraft servers or into these spaces, we go through those rules together and we talk about whether he wants to abide by them, whether he wants to be in a space where those are the way other people might treat him. Hmm. And so we're having a conversation about the nature of social interaction in these spaces. And that's really changed the way we talk about his experience in them. So that, that's been really eye-opening for me. Wow. And that makes perfect sense. You know, in the in-person world, we, I think, much more naturally distinguish between different spaces. Katie mentioned this actually, where, you know, a kid walks into school and they know that there is a certain set of rules that they're supposed to follow. And then a kid walks into their bedroom and they know that there are other rules that they can follow or maybe places of worship. And they know that there are a different set of rules for that space. And so it does stand to reason absolutely that as we start to spend more time online, in different contexts. We need to set kids up for success by helping establish what the rules are before they step into that virtual room. Yeah, and it's not even just rules, like in the physical world, it's norms and manners and customs mm -hmm. and all these things that we embed in our kids from the moment they're born. We teach them the way we want them to live and exist in the world in different spaces, at different times, with different people. And so it's embedded in us, but this is new and there's new types of social interaction enabled in these spaces. So we have to develop new norms, new manners, but that requires talking about it. Absolutely. And I guess the final thing I'll say about this episode and what I've learned from it is it's it's just increasingly clear to me that these games and these experiences are normalizing our kids' generation to virtual spaces and to what ultimately could be metaverses. Mm -hmm. They are comfortable in these spaces in a way we are generally not, where adults are not, and they are growing up in a world where the digital to them means places with social interaction, with commerce places where they can build themselves. And all of those are the core components of what many people are pushing as the metaverse. Right. So I, I think that's something we need to be sort of intimately aware of here. I mean, I suppose at this point, it probably feels like the ship has sailed in terms of being able to decide whether or not to engage. So we need to be very careful about how 
especially at this phase where things are still being built, right? So there still is an opportunity to learn from other platforms that we have kids on, from the mistakes there, and hopefully take those lessons and use them to build a metaverse that's more kid-friendly from the start so that we're not backtracking in the way that it seems like we've had to do in so many other digital spaces. Next episode, we'll look at slightly younger kids and find out whether screen time is breaking their brains. See you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of Screen Time from TVO, Antica Productions, and the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy at McGill University. I produce this show along with our senior producer, Kevin Sexton. Mixing and sound design by Phil Wilson and Mitchell Stewart. Production assistance by Emily Morantz. Research assistance by Sonia Solomon, Cody Hauka, and Helen Hayes. Our executive producer is Laura Aguirre. Stuart Cox is the president of Antica. Katie O'Connor is the senior producer of podcasts at TVO. Lori Few is the executive producer for digital at TVO. If you like what you heard, tell a friend. I have good spelling because I play like Roblox all the time and I've been typing for, I don't know, five, six years and for like every day, actually about seven years.